Hi, friends. Welcome to this week's sermon on the Daryl Johnson podcast. In case you're just jumping in here, this is week four of Making Maturing Disciples of Christ, a series that Daryl did during his time at First Baptist Church in 2013. In this message, looking at Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 47, Daryl seeks to answer the question of what it takes to grow up as a follower of Jesus. Now, most of us would agree it is a great privilege to be able to follow Jesus, but how do we grow in him? Daryl identifies what the early church devoted themselves to, as recorded by Luke in the book of Acts, the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer, showing these to be the marking characteristics of a spirit-animated community. Well, with all that said, I'll hand it off to Daryl. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 37 to 47, and can be found printed inside your worship folder. If you are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Living God, we believe that you inspired Luke to write these words. And we believe that you have uh, saved them over all of these centuries for us. And I pray now in your mercy and grace that you would make these words come alive in us as never before. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are currently engaged in a series of sermons exploring the unspeakable privilege Jesus Christ is giving us. The crucified and risen Jesus is giving us the privilege of living in this city as his disciples. So we're asking, what does this mean in the real world? What does it look like 24-7, 365 to be disciples of Jesus? We are asking, how are disciples made? We are asking, how do disciples mature into all that Jesus wants to give them? We are asking, what does it take? What does it take to actually grow up as a follower of the Savior of the world? It takes a community. You've heard the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a village to raise a disciple. It takes a community to mature disciples. But not just any kind of community. It it takes a highly specialized community. It takes a community shaped by the coming of the Holy Spirit. It takes a community invaded by, occupied by, animated by the wind and fire of the living God. 
It takes the kind of community described in the text we just read. The community described by Luke the physician who knows a thing or two about wholeness and health. It takes the community brought into being by the Pentecost event to raise maturing disciples of the Lord of the universe. Review the story again. Luke says, Acts 2, verse 1, that they were all together in one place when the day of Pentecost came. Literally, it is, when the day of Pentecost had been fulfilled. Pentecost was one of the three major festivals people of Israel celebrated. Passover, Tabernacles, and Pentecost. It began as an agricultural feast, celebrating the first fruits of the spring crop. It was therefore also called first fruits. Deuteronomy 16, the feast of harvest of the first fruits of your labor. It was celebrated 50 days after Passover, hence Pentecost, Penta 50th. 50 days after Passover, 50 days after the feast that celebrates God liberating his people from oppression and slavery. Pentecost also celebrated the giving of the law, the giving of God's good law. The feast celebrated the wonderful fact that the creator and redeemer does not leave humanity to figure out how to make our way through a broken world. The creator and the redeemer speaks and reveals what the good life looks like. When the day of Pentecost had come, says Luke, when the day of Pentecost had been fulfilled 50 days after Jesus' death and resurrection, 50 days after God's victory over all that keeps human beings from living fully human, fully alive, 50 days after overcoming the power of sin and evil and death, when the day of Pentecost had been fulfilled, the Spirit came. The Spirit of God came. The Holy Spirit came. Suddenly, says Luke. I like that. Suddenly, it means no one prepared for this. No one planned Pentecost. No committee met and strategized the coming of the Holy Spirit. Suddenly, from heaven, says Luke, an act of God, a free and sovereign act of God. And the place where they were gathered the place where 120 disciples were gathered, the same place where Jesus had washed disciples' feet, the same place where he gave his new covenant sealed in his blood, the same place where he spoke his new commandment, love one another as I have loved you, the same place where he promised another paraclete, as he put it, another advocate, another companion, taking his place in his physical absence, in that same place, in an apartment, somewhere in the core of downtown Vancouver, suddenly, from heaven, a noise like a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire and the world has never been the same. When the day of Pentecost had come, God fulfilled the promise that is scattered throughout the Hebrew scriptures. Isaiah, I will pour my spirit upon my descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Ezekiel, I will not hide my face from you anymore. I will pour my spirit on the house of Israel. And Joel chapter 2 The text Peter quotes when he stands up and attempts to explain the event of Pentecost. It shall be in the last days, says God, that I will pour forth of my spirit upon all flesh. And again, I will pour forth of my spirit. Which is why Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the promise of the Father. On Easter evening, he said, I am sending the promise of the Father on you. Forty days after Easter, before ascending to the throne, he says, wait for the promise of the Father, which you heard from me. John baptized you in and with water, but you shall be baptized in and with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Peter, standing up before the 120 and before the thousands more who had heard and seen what was going on and gathered around this community, Peter declares the gospel of Pentecost. Acts 2.33, having received from the Father the promised gift, he, Jesus, 
poured out that which you see and hear. And the place was filled. The whole house, says Luke, was filled. And the filling spilled over into the city streets. And a different kind of community began to emerge. A spirit invaded community. A spirit occupied community. A spirit inundated community. A spirit cleansed community. A spirit enlivened community. A spirit animated community. The first fruits of those who follow the new human, the God man, Jesus Christ. Notice the last line. Of Luke the physician's description of this different kind of community. Acts 2.47. Notice what he says. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. The day began with 120 disciples. It ended with 3,000 more. Those who were being saved. Being saved by whom? Being saved by the 120 who had gathered in the room that day, being saved by the apostles, being saved by prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers. No. By the Lord who had poured out the Holy Spirit. The great evangelist himself, the missionary God, was moving through the city of Jerusalem, calling people to Jesus, bringing them into salvation. The Lord was adding It happened on the first Pentecost, and it is happening today, all over the world today, and it's happening in our city. Someone once said to me, God is saving people all around us all the time. He's just looking for a place where he can lead them so they can grow up. Like a mother bird looking for a place where newborns can be placed so that they can grow up. That place, that nest, if you will, that village, that community where newly won disciples of Jesus Christ can grow up is the community shaped by Pentecost. A devoted community. Do you see that word in Luke's description of the community that emerges when Jesus pours out the Spirit? Devoted. Acts 2.42. They were continually devoting themselves to Acts 2.46, day by day continuing with, literally is day by day devoting. The Spirit of God creates a new community with new devotions. Now, it's an intense word that Paul, uh, that, that Luke uses here. Uh, this word devote means stick by. It means to be close at hand. It means to attach oneself to. It means to wait on. Luke uses this word later in the book of Acts where he describes soldiers who are waiting on their commander. They stand close at hand. They stick by. They are attached to the commander. They are at the disposal of their leader. Yes, sir, is their posture in the world. Anything you want, sir. Of course, sir. Ready any time, sir. I'll do whatever you tell me to do, sir. That's devotion. Imagine on this Victoria Day that Queen Elizabeth actually came into our midst. Most of us would then automatically shift into devotion especially those who have taken an oath of allegiance to her. Yes, your royal highness. Anything you want, your royal highness. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. They were continually devoting themselves, says Luke. Day by day, they were devoting themselves. This word that Luke uses also also means to persist in, to busy oneself with, to hold fast to, to persevere in. The Spirit is here. Do you, do you believe this? The Holy Spirit is here. The promise of the Father is here. The another paraclete is here. God the Spirit is here. Stick by the Spirit. Attach yourself to the Spirit. Wait on the Spirit. Be devoted to the Spirit. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's how we mature as a disciple. We grow up by devoting ourselves to the Spirit who then creates in us new devotions. Look carefully at Acts 2.42. 
2.42. And look how Luke describes this spirit-occupied, spirit-animated community. And they were continually devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Do you see the definite article, the, in the text? Do you hear the the? It appears twice in the English text. But in the Greek text, it's there four times. The the is there with every one of these spirit animated devotions. So literally the text reads, and they were continually devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the fellowship and to the breaking of the bread and to the prayers. Now focus on each of the the one at a time and begin with what I think is the key devotion, the fellowship. They were continually devoting themselves to the fellowship. Here, Luke is pointing to something that revolutionizes our understanding of what it means to be church. The word translated fellowship is the word koinonia. They were continually devoting themselves to koinonia. Now, here's the key to this key devotion. Koinonia is always in. In the Bible, koinonia is always in something or someone or some cause. We do not simply meet together and have fellowship. We always have fellowship in. Fellowship is always in, in something or in someone. And what makes fellowship, fellowship is the in. The something, the someone, or the cause. Now, when the New Testament uses this word koinonia, it regularly refers to a very special kind of koinonia. Koinonia refers to, ready? Ready? Koinonia refers to fellowship in God. Fellowship in the triune God. Koinonia is always in, in the triune God. Now, if we were to watch this Pentecost birth community coming into being that day, we would see men and women from all different cultures, by the way, hanging out together. And they appear to be enjoying fellowship with one another, with other human beings. And they are. But they're doing more. They're doing a whole lot more. They are experiencing koinonia in the Trinity, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's why Paul, Luke uses the definite article, the. The koinonia, the great koinonia, the koinonia of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the temple and in their homes day by day, koinonia with each other in the Trinity. And so the Apostle John can write in his first letter, listen to this, what we have seen and heard we proclaim to you that you also may have fellowship, koinonia with us, and our fellowship, our koinonia is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 3. And I love how J.B. Phillips translates this. We want you to be with us in this, in this fellowship with the Father and Jesus Christ, his Son. We must write and tell you about it because the more that fellowship extends, the greater the joy it brings to us who are already in it. <laughs> We can therefore restate Luke's description of this spirit animated community this way. They were continually devoting themselves to participation in the divine koinonia. Yes, they were having koinonia with each other. As they enjoyed their chips and dip, their veggies and their cheese, they were having fellowship with other human beings. But Luke is also celebrating the, this, the fact in the the. They were having fellowship in the koinonia with one another in the koinonia in the triune God of grace in the temple and in their homes, spending time with each other, encouraging one another, supporting one another. But in the process, they were spending time with the Trinity. They were encouraging and supporting one another in this great divine koinonia. You see, the living God is one, but not solitary. 
The living God is one, but not alone. The living God has forever existed as fellowship, as koinonia. The living God has forever existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And St. Augustine, followed by many other great thinkers, argued that the Holy Spirit is the embodiment of this fellowship between the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit comes to bring us into this koinonia. Our fellowship with one another is not just with one another. It is with and it is in the triune God. We've been brought into this fellowship by the work of the Son and the power of the Spirit. They devoted themselves to the koinonia, to joining together in the incredible love that has forever been shared in this divine community. You see, it is being in that fellowship that makes us one. We find our unity not in agreement on every theological point, not in our social agenda, not in styles of worship, not in forms of government. We find our unity in the mutual participation in the triune koinonia. We find our unity in being drawn by the Spirit into the friendship at the center of the universe, the friendship that has forever thrived as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which means fellowship groups... Fellowship groups are going to be alive to the degree that the members of the group want to move into the great fellowship. Now, it's out of this fellowship that ministry emerges. Luke says of the new community, 244, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds of all as as any had need. Now, who told the community to do that? Who told this new community that they ought to share in this way? No one told them. No one. It's the automatic, natural response to participating in the divine koinonia. It's more than an interesting linguistic observation to note that the word generous in the New Testament is the word koinonakos. Participating in koinonia makes you koinonikos. Participating in the outrageous love of the divine fellowship makes you an outrageous lover. Our view of our possessions is transformed. Luke says they had all in common. The word common is the word koina. Are you surprised? (laughs) Once we participate in the divine koinonia, we come to realize that we are all in this together and that we hold all things in common. Which says to me that in the community shaped by the Spirit, no one should ever go without the essentials of life. Experiencing the Trinitarian koinonia breaks the grip of greed, which is really the grip of fear, and makes us koinonikos people. I know a church in San Francisco, when it comes time to receive God's tithes and our offerings, the leader will say, give generously. And if you're here and have any need, feel free to take from the plate what you want. The koinonia. They were devoted to the koinonia. The Holy Spirit comes and drew them into the Trinitarian fellowship of extravagant love. And how did they know this? And how did they stay alive to the wonder? Luke says they were continually devoting themselves, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Why? Because the Holy Spirit who animates the new community is the spirit of truth. Jesus uses that title of the Holy Spirit more than any other title, the Spirit of Truth. And the Holy Spirit's great compassion is that, passion is that we know the truth, the truth about Jesus, the truth about ourselves, the truth about history, the truth about salvation. Well, why were they devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles? Because of what it means to be an apostle. Apostle means sent one. An apostle is sent by another who's been authorized to speak on behalf of the another. Uh, Caesar, in the first century, had his apostles. He had these apostles who were authorized to bring his message to the people. And the citizens of Rome expressed their devotion to Caesar, Caesar by being devoted to the message of Caesar's apostles. 
The risen Jesus has apostles, people sent by Jesus, authorized by Jesus to speak Jesus' message. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, not because the apostles were better communicators than anyone else. Actually, they were not, but because the apostles had been authorized by the risen Lord to speak his word to the city and the church. Therefore, to sit at the feet of the apostles is to sit at the feet of Jesus. Their word is his word. And we express our devotion to Jesus. We stick close to Jesus. We attach ourselves to Jesus. We participate in Jesus as we stick close to the teaching of the apostles. Which is why a community devoted to the apostles' teaching is the community in which disciples can mature. No apostles' teaching, no maturity. Soak in the apostles' teaching, and there's blossoming and flourishing of disciples. Do you want to know Jesus? I mean, really know him. And do you want to experience his fellowship with the Father and the Spirit? Well, then soak in the word. Soak in the apostles' letters. Soak in the apostles' gospels. I'll never forget an experience I had in the first church I served as a senior minister. One Sunday morning after the service, a woman, one of the key leaders of the church, railed on me. It happens. Just railed on me. And why did she rail on me? Because I had been preaching Jesus too much. She was disturbed that as a new pastor, I was constantly talking about Jesus. And she was disturbed by the things I was saying about Jesus. Jesus crucified for the sin of the world. Jesus objectively raised from the dead. Jesus really alive. Jesus by whom and for whom we were made. You know, really basic stuff. And she was very disturbed, a leader of the church. That morning, as she railed on me, she even called me a heretic. Boy, that was a challenging congregation I was called to serve. And I suggested that we should meet together and talk through this. And so we were able to set up an appointment that week. The congregation was smaller then, and I could be that spontaneous. Oh, I wish I still could be. And in my office, I told her that I was only preaching what the apostles taught. I I was preaching the Jesus of the apostles. Why do that, she asked. Uh, So I helped her understand the meaning of apostles. This is crazy, she said. And then I reminded her that when she and the other leaders installed me as the pastor of the church, they extracted from me a vow, an oath. It went like this. Daryl, do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and God's word to you? And I had said yes. And in my office, she confessed that she really didn't understand the meaning of that oath. (laughs) So I proposed, as an act of integrity, that she try an experiment to test this oath. I proposed that she read through the Gospel of John. And that as she reads through the Gospel of John, she is simply to pray, Jesus, if you're alive, and if you are who John says you are, make yourself real to me. That was my proposal. I expected her to say, now that's really crazy. And instead she said, okay, I'll try it. Two weeks later, she came back to my office unannounced, and I could see that something had happened. She sat down across my desk, and she said, I I do not know what being born again is all about. I had never used the word born again because I knew where I was in that church, and that would set off too many fires. But she discovered the word born again by reading John 3. And she said, I don't know what being born again is all about, but I think it happened to me. (laughs) I think Jesus... Is who he says he is. I think Jesus is who John said he is. And I think I love him. One month later, her husband came to Saving Faith. Two months later, a couple they hung out with in the church came to Saving Faith. And four months later, all the leaders on the board were reading the Gospels and they had come to know Jesus. People grow up into Jesus in communities where there is an unapologetic devotion to the teaching of Jesus' apostles. And Luke says, they were devoting themselves to the breaking of the bread. Now, at one level, Luke is referring to the fact that people were taking their meals together. Acts 2.46, day by day, devoting 
to breaking bread from house to house. Now, as you know, there is no way to exaggerate the centrality of meals in first century Middle East or in 21st century Middle East. When you share a meal together in that culture, it's almost a sacramental act. In the Middle East, when you eat together, you are expressing unconditional acceptance. That's true in Africa. It's true in Asia. Luke tells us in his gospel that the religious leaders were horrified that Jesus was having meals with sinners and tax collectors. Jesus was welcoming tax collectors and sinners as members of his own family. To eat a meal with someone expresses unconditional love. It, during the time of the meal, and especially during the time that the food they shared is still in the body... So the new community came together day by day in the temple and in their homes, expressing this unconditional love, the unconditional love experienced in the divine koinonia. By the way, one of the simplest ways that we can be this kind of community in our city is to eat more meals together. At breakfast last Thursday morning, Sharon, who has great gifts of administration, started dreaming about how we could orchestrate meals in all the postal codes codes represented in this place. If we ate more meals together, oh. But notice the the. They were devoting themselves to the breaking of the bread. Now Luke uses this phrase in his gospel. In chapter 24, in the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, the story that Abraham Hahn preached for us the Sunday after Easter, the two disciples do not recognize Jesus as Jesus. And along the way, Jesus starts to open the scriptures for them and shows them that Messiah had to be crucified and then be raised on the third day. And the disciples say that as Jesus opened the Bible to them, their hearts were strangely warmed. Toward the end of the journey, they want Jesus to come and join them for a meal. And while they're eating together, Jesus takes a loaf of bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them. And Luke says that when Jesus broke the bread, their eyes were opened and they recognized him as Jesus. They run back to Jerusalem and they tell the other disciples about their experience and how he had, they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. Luke 24, 35. How they had recognized him in the breaking of the bread. It's actually better than that. Not just how they recognized him in the breaking of the bread, but how he made himself known in the breaking of the bread. The risen Lord made himself known in the book, scripture, and in the breaking of the bread. In the Lord's Supper, he had made himself known to them. Yes, when we participate in the Lord's Supper, we do something, right? We do something. We remember. Do this in remembrance of me. But the glory of this event is that when we participate in it, he does something. He makes himself known. How he does that, I do not know. But somehow, the Holy Spirit, whose passion it is that we know Jesus, makes Jesus known when the bread is broken. Which is why the community was continually devoting themselves to the breaking of the bread. It's during the Jesus meal that Jesus by by his spirit brings us into the center of all things and draws us more deeply into the divine fellowship. And Luke says they were continually devoting themselves to the prayers. Not just to prayer, but to the prayers. The prayers refers to the prayers the people of God were given long ago and have been praying for centuries. The prayers refers to the prayers prayed in the temple. The prayers refers to the psalms that were being prayed and being sung. Yes, this new community is offering up spontaneous prayer about their concrete needs, their fears and their longings. And and you see this in the rest of the book of Acts. But they were also devoting themselves. They were attaching themselves to the prayers the Holy Spirit inspired, to the Psalms, speaking the Psalms and singing the Psalms. At our CLT retreat a couple of weeks ago, we took 30 minutes on Saturday morning to simply pray the Psalms. We started with Psalm 1 and just kept moving. Someone would read a few lines and then we'd jump to the next. Another person would pick it up and read a few more lines for 30 minutes. That was the most real experience of prayer I had with a group of people in my life. Continually devoting themselves to the prayers. 
day by day in the temple and in their homes. In light of Christmas, that God has now come among us as one of us. In light of Good Friday, that God has done everything to make this fellowship possible. In light of Pentecost, God coming to be with us and in us, they begin to understand what these prayers have been praying all those centuries. And they prayed them with greater vigor and anticipation. And that gave fruit to even more prayers. Prayers like Ephesians 3. That you be the Spirit, strengthen you with power in the inner person. That Christ dwell in your hearts. That you be able to comprehend the incomprehensible love of Christ. That you be filled up to all the fullness of God. The prayers, the Spirit breathed prayers. They were devoting themselves to those prayers. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a disciple. A spirit. Spirit invaded community, a spirit filled community, a spirit animated community devoted to the fellowship, the Trinitarian fellowship, devoted to the apostles teaching to the word of those authorized to speak on Jesus behalf, devoted to the breaking of the bread, the meal where he chooses to make himself known and devoted to the prayers, to these prayers that move us more deeply into the fellowship of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Are we surprised then by what else Luke says about this community? There was awe. They were all feeling a sense of awe, says Luke. Of course. The Spirit was there and moving among them. The Spirit who in the beginning breathed over the waters of chaos and brought the world into being. The Spirit who hovered over the womb of the Virgin Mary and brought the God-man into being. The Spirit who in the tomb Help raise Jesus from the dead. That was who was there. That is who is here. That is who is moving among us. And they were filled with a sense of awe and joy, says Luke. They were taking their meals together with gladness. Of course, someone has said joy is the emotion you experience when you know you've come home. This is what I was made for. This is the kind of community I'm longing for. And wonders and signs says Luke. But of course, the medical doctor is referring to the very kinds of things Jesus of Nazareth was doing that he describes in his gospel. Jesus' deeds of reconciliation and healing and liberation. The Spirit was continuing Jesus' work in that community. Paul will say later to the community in Corinth, to each one of you is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To each one of you is given the ability to cooperate with the Spirit in His creative work. The Spirit continues the work of Jesus in and through the Jesus community. And Luke says, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. You see, the Holy Spirit is the great seeker. To be a seeker-sensitive church means to be sensitive to the seeker who is winning people all over our city, even as we stand here today, and the Spirit is simply looking for a place where He can place a new believer who will be welcomed and can be built up into the fullness of Christ. So what do we do today? On this Pentecost Sunday, what are we supposed to do? I suggest it's this. We are to say to the wind and fire of God. We are to say to the breath and very life of the Trinity. We are to say, you are welcome here. Can you say that? You are welcome here. here. And we are to say, you are free to do anything you want to do here. Can you say that? We won't be able to manage or control it. You know that. You are free. And we say, be to us, in us, and for us all you are to the glory of Jesus Christ who loves to pour you out on his disciples. Happy Pentecost. Hi, friends. I trust you were encouraged by the message that you just heard that you were able to understand the Word of God a little bit better, and that you came to know and love Jesus a little bit more. I mean, that's the point of all these messages when all is said and done. 
If you'd like more resources like this, more notes, uh, some of the books I've written, which are actually uh, containing the sermons that I've done, you can find that information at the website that my friends have made, darylljohnson.ca. God bless.